we need to, to start sharing and kind of stop comparing, really, don't we? I mean, Rochelle, we were talking earlier about about never wanting to be the person who forgets that it's non-uniform day. Or the, the one mum in the playground it who gets it wrong. It will be me. It will be me. I guaranteed I'm the one that hasn't put 50p in the book bag for cake sale. It will be me. But I think, I think as you, as touch on what you were saying, I think that if we were all a bit more honest, and we're, we're all guilty, we want everyone to speak out, but if we were all a little bit more honest and just shared the really poo day, I'm choosing my words carefully, um, as, as well as the amazing time where we took our child to a pumpkin patch and it was lovely, like, let, let's, you know, let's look at, you know, actually I've had a terrible night, I've been up all night and my face is swollen because I've had no sleep, you know, let's all be a little bit more honest. Um, speaking about that, moving on subject a little bit um, with Matulu now, and we, we reflected a bit before about, you know, different different cultures maybe not being as accepting, you know, it's hard enough as it is, but being as accepting with mental illness. And I know that you struggled with that quite a bit, didn't you? I did. Um, I have two children. My first son is 13 and my last born is two. And when I had my son, I was 16 years old. And um, in my culture, I'm Ghanaian, British born Ghanaian. And um, my, well, my household at the time, because I was living with my mother, just only my mother and my younger sister, my mother went through a lot of things herself. You know, she struggled with depression, she struggled with so much things to do with herself, identity, all of that. And what I saw is that my mother basically carried on the same traditions within her household as a child. And within that household, she wasn't able to express herself. So when it came to her raising her own children, that still carried, that reflected, it, refle yeah. it reflected right through. And however she was feeling, she was always told not to say anything. You have to be strong, you have to get on with it. And as a black woman, we often have adopted that, that stereotype that, you know, we're strong and, you know, we just have to get on with it. We don't, we, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's constantly shown up, you know, we don't have the men in the household, so we have to adopt this whole I'm masculine as well as feminine attitude, you know? And um, yeah, it carried through, it carried through with me. So being a young mother at, at 16 years old, I didn't know that there was even such thing called as postnatal depression. I didn't know that there was even depression. And that it was okay that that was what you were going through. It, was, it wasn't even a thing that it was okay. I didn't even know how I was feeling. I didn't even know. I felt these feelings, but I didn't know how to articulate myself. And I didn't know who to talk to. And if I did say to my mother, oh, mum, you know, or not even a thing of saying anything, but if I was reacting a certain way, she wouldn't, she wouldn't identify it. She wouldn't discuss it. It would just be a thing of you're behaving like this we're gonna ostracize you, you know? So it's been a very difficult thing for me. And now coming into this, coming into womanhood, I'm nearly 30 now, so I have a lot of sisters around me that are very open about their experiences. And, you know, we share, we share a lot. And I feel that it's very important as a mother that you have a sisterhood with you. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the support of your mother or family or a husband or a boyfriend, whoever, if you do have even just one friend you know, that within itself you can find. Some, some, in some cases, that's the therapy you need, that's just to talk. That one yeah. girlfriend, that one, just a support system, you know, whoever exactly. it may be. Exactly, and that is what I've had to rely on, you know, more so than ever. And I'm grateful for that. Regardless, I'm grateful for that. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Matilda. Anna? Uh, keep the thoughts coming uh, using the hashtag MumTakeOver. Uh, thank you to all of you who've got in touch so far. Um, an awful lot of people just sharing experiences and sharing thoughts, um, but also some of you just, I mean this one example, for example on Facebook, says it's just so heartwarming to hear all of these mums speaking out about their difficulties and struggles. It's not easy to be open and honest about personal struggles, but by speaking out they're helping so many others who might be going through similar right now. And, and that, that's part of it as well, Neve. I mean, we talked right at the beginning about how you made that decision to start talking about yeah. it. And, and there are so many you know, big moments in our lives where at the time, the last thing you want to do is speak about it. Because sometimes, you know, I, I talked about my pregnancy loss. I couldn't do that for five years without knowing that I could have a conversation, actually finish yeah. that conversation without getting upset. Yeah. And, but it's a moment where you feel that you can actually do something for somebody else, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, in my case, I um, just, just very briefly to tell you what, what went on with me, 
My husband and I wanted to have children for years, and we just, we just couldn't get pregnant. There was nothing wrong with us, but we just couldn't get pregnant. And in that time, I definitely think I went into a depression uh, before I even got pregnant. I was depressed. Um, when I was pregnant, I had a great pregnancy. I was so happy that I had got pregnant, you know, holistically with acupuncture and Chinese herbs, and I was just so happy. Um, and then when Genevieve was born, I, I had a planned C-section, as I mentioned. It's always tough to recover from any birth, but C-sections are really tough. You can't just get out of bed and go for a walk and do the things that would normally help clear your mind. Um, you can also not prepare yourself sometimes for circumstances after birth. I found out when my daughter was three months old, I had a slip disc in my back and I needed back surgery, which meant a lot of separation from Genevieve, which had a huge impact on breastfeeding, and I had to give up breastfeeding, and that's when it really hit me hard. That's when my mental you know, stability just went under. I don't know if anyone here struggled with breastfeeding, but once we, we couldn't really get the hang of it and I had to stop, I just didn't feel like a proper mum. Yeah. I felt like a complete failure, and it just opened this portal of negativity, and that just spiralled out of control for me. Um, you know, I can tell you all that I, I felt suicidal. I, I was in hospital waiting to have an MRI on my back with my baby away from me. It was Diwali, which is the Festival of Lights. My whole family were together, and I thought, you know what? I, I shouldn't be here anymore. I'm not a good enough mum. I'll never be the kind of mum that Genevieve needs and wants and deserves. I should just end it all. And it was in that instant that I went to my lowest possible point in my mind that I snapped myself out of it. And my will, something happened, and I knew from that moment on that I would never look back. I, I had been given all these fantastic gifts in life and blessed with all this happiness. What was I doing? And someone mentioned it earlier, you just sometimes have to shake yourself out of it if yeah. you're lucky enough to have that internal strength. And from that moment onwards, I honestly just felt better day by day. And, yeah, I knew, and you could feel it. I yeah. knew that I needed to help people. Yeah. Because I thought, if I'm somebody who says that I'm strong and I do motivational speaking and I do stand-up comedy and I do all this, if people yeah. can know that I went that low and I managed to get myself out of it, um, you know, with some support, talking to people, yeah. acupuncture, I, didn't, I wasn't medicated, I managed to get out of it on my yeah. own. Then and if anyone can, can do it. Catch someone at that moment as yes. well and, and do the same thing Absolutely. for them. Uh, Rochelle. So I'm joined with Juvin and obviously we're speaking about a lot of a lot of our guests today have found it helpful to channel to channel something whether it's talking about it whether it's helping p other people like you were just saying um, education has been that channel for you hasn't it yeah yeah definitely I mean at, at 18 years old um, when I had my baby it was about you know it was really difficult. I'd lost all my friends. Um, I'd lost, you know, all of that sense of, you know. Well, your life is very different. You're, you're instantly sort of separated, aren't you? I guess if your friends aren't going through that at the same time as you. Exactly. So it was very really different. I think, I think what really did help me was going back to, to school. I remember I was in year 12 at the time, and then I took a gap year and went back into year 13. And um, from there, I just went straight to university. And I think, you know, being, I used to call myself a part-time mom, um, you know, part-time mom, part-time student. And, you know, being around people my age, doing things that mattered to me and, and feeling like I had, I was working on my own future. Um, that was really helpful because, yes, I mean, you know, hearing someone actually speaking, you know, openly about feeling suicidal. It happens to a lot of moms and you feel guilty for even feeling that way. You feel, you feel selfish, you feel, you know, you feel angry with yourself. And I think actually getting out there and doing things for you you know, um, taking care of yourself. I think as a mum, obviously, you know that you're that's what you're supposed to you're supposed to take care of this child. And I think it's a shock, isn't it? You have this baby and you're like, right, this is this is my life now. Yeah. But taking care of you is so important for the baby. Yeah, I mean, because they need you and you need yourself so much, so much as well, because and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with just taking a minute, whether you run yourself a bath or just whatever it might be, just taking a minute for you. Yeah, and I feel, and I feel like so many, so many people make you um, feel guilty for um, enjoying your own time, your alone time. And sometimes I did feel very guilty for being very obsessed about my essays and wanting to have a, a first or something like that and, and having to leave my son. But 
you know, at the same time, I knew that I was doing that for him because I needed to show my little boy that, you know what, you have to work hard um, and I needed to be successful. I needed, I needed him to see me work hard. And even though you're doing it for yourself, it seems selfish, but you are really doing it for that child. You need to be a strong person for that child. And, I, and when I say education helped me, it's the fact that I was able to be, to be doing something for me. Focusing on something and put, you put channeling your energy into something other than baby. Yeah. I think the mum guilt is something that for all of us here, I think that will always be there, right? That, that mum guilt is a, is a big thing. Uh, thanks for coming today. Thank you very much. Anna. Yeah, that feeds us actually, Rochelle, really neatly into the, the final topic that we're going to talk about, which is work-life balance. And of all the times that you feel guilty, probably that moment, maybe it's the first time you go off to work after having the baby, you go back after maternity leave, or maybe it's when you're late home one day, you miss dinner, you miss bedtime, and those bits of guilt are the ones that are really hard to deal with, I think, aren't they? Um, we used that in our YouGov survey for Five Live, and we asked mums who were trying to juggle everything, and dads as well, what kind of guilt that gave them. 30% uh, of working mums, interestingly, said that they'd felt discriminated against at work because they're a parent. Uh, it's interesting because only 14% of working dads had had that same feeling that that they weren't maybe being treated the same as somebody who wasn't a parent. I mean, discrimination is just one part of it. There's the guilt, the pressure, the money worries, all of these things. I mean, talking to our panel again, when I went back uh, after having my first, I had to go back when he was three months old. And in looking back now, so he's five years old now, so this, this is a long time ago, and even me now would say to me then, what are you so worried about? I didn't dare ask for somewhere to express, because I was still breastfeeding, because he was three months old. I wasn't making a great job of it. We were saying breastfeeding's not easy. But I didn't dare go to my boss and say, have you got a quiet room where I can express while I'm here? Because I thought that would look weak and I didn't want to be a problem. You know, I think especially when you go back after maternity leave, you don't want them to think, oh, look, there's another thing we've got to deal with for Anna. And, oh, she's so demanding and she wants so much. Is she really up to this? And do we need to think about, you know, all of these things that kind of come into your mind, Annie, don't they? You, you just, maybe like no time you'd ever had in life before, you just feel like you have got to wear a suit of armour. Absolutely. I became editor-in-chief of Netmums when I returned from maternity leave after my, my second child, my daughter. And she then didn't sleep for another year and a half. So I, I can remember being that person who kind of walked in, trying to look like I had a spring in my step, thinking, I slept for two hours last night. Please be kind to me. But of course, you don't say it, do you? No. I think one of the things we really need to talk about is not even just the serious stuff like postnatal depression, postnatal anxiety, but just say, I'm tired today, or I would like a room to express in, please, or can I go early because it's my child's assembly and that my child really, really wants me to be there but at three o'clock. can we do that? Because there are some bosses who are great and fantastic, and, and I've always been very lucky that mine have, but there are, there are occasions where the reason you don't want to say it is because you know that it wouldn't, it wouldn't go down well. Remember that you have rights, and you do have rights, and they are enshrined by law, and you must speak up. Um, get HR on side if you need to get them on side, but also be true to yourself, and be honest with yourself. You got, you stayed and went back to that job, and you got that job in the first place because you were a talented person, you were the right person for the job. You have skills and talents that haven't gone to waste when you've been off on maternity leave. If anything, you've become a more brilliant person on maternity leave because your multitasking skills, I am sure, <laughs> have That's improved more than anybody else's. So have some faith in yourself. Like, mums are amazing people. Look at all the mums in this room now who are juggling kids on their knees and talking to the person next to them and listening and, like, we know how to multitask, we know how to do these things. Have faith in yourself and stand up for yourself, you need to. Yeah, and it's finding time to do those things. I mean, Giovanna, you write books. I'm, <laughs> I'm astonished because I tried to change broadband provider the other week <laughs> and I couldn't get through that without the kids. Mummy, can I just, Mummy, what are you doing? When, and you managed to write whole novels, for goodness sake. How I, do you find the time? Yeah, the time thing is, is quite difficult and I have to set aside time. So, I, you know, I treat it like a job. Uh, so I have time away from the kids and then I do the bedtime and dinner time and everything else routine and then I start writing again so it's not that glamorous but what I found recently because I've been doing a, like a book promo tour is that every single interview I'm asked about how I juggle how I cope with the juggle Tom my husband is never asked about the juggle in interviews never that's true and I find that yeah. really really interesting uh, there is a lot of pressure 
on women, I think. You know, if you have that career, then you, well, you've got to fit it in somewhere. You wanted it. But if you don't, then there's other guilt for being a stay-at-home mum. Danielle, you, you know, we're, we're polar opposites in that way. But I don't think what you do as a stay-at-home mum is, is relaxing, really. I think it's still a full-time job. Yeah, more than a full-time job. And um, one of the other things that really grates on me is when people say, I'm a full-time mum, because you're just as much a full-time mum. You don't put them to one side and leave them there. And I'm a stay-at-home mum, doing no choice of my own, because sadly I was uh, medically retired at 32. But the guilt's still there. I still think, if I could be at work, would I be at work? And has that made me a worse mum? Because should I still be at home, I have a child with additional needs. And the support that she needs is absolutely huge. And I am lucky that I am home to juggle all the extra appointments and all the provision things that she needs. But it is a constant battle in my own mind of, I've been forced into a situation that maybe I should have chose anyway. Maybe I should have been at home to do that and not put my own, I don't know if it's a need, but it's definitely a want to be something more than just a mom. But don't you think that either way you'd be feeling that mum guilt? Yeah, very likely. Because if I was still at home, would I be wondering that I'm not giving them an aspiration? I have two girls, would I be thinking they've not got the aspiration to get out and do what they want to do? I had an amazing job that I absolutely adored. And would they have that drive or would they think it's, you know, fine to be at home and be a mum? And it, it, and it is fine to be at home and be a mum, but... Then there's the financial side. Should I be putting more in the pot, giving a little bit? We just question ourselves, don't we? Whatever we do, it's analysing it all the time, going, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, constant juggling of emotions and thoughts. Um, and who, who's got the right answer? No one, basically. Because I think we're all doing, all the time, exactly what's working for our family. And even if it's not, it's on our heads. You know, like, no one else. Like, I always say, Joan down the road, she's not in your situation. She doesn't know. Uh, so just do what you're doing, because you're going to be doing the best for your family. Did you have a question uh, for the panel? Yeah, I just wondered, generationally, why do you think mums have kind of changed? I personally think that it seems... Nowadays, it's not as acceptable to be a stay-at-home mom, and people can be judged a little bit more harshly if that's their choice. It kind of feels that mums need to have a focus and be moving forward and juggling more than just being a mom, which is the most important job, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but why do you think that's kind of changed as the years have gone by? Do you know, Amanda, I'm just looking, Amanda, who's watching on Facebook, Amanda Baker says almost exactly that. I'm a stay-at-home mum to a four-year-old and a seven-month-old. I've struggled with uh, depression as a stay-at-home mum. As a girl at school, she said, it's drilled into us to aim for that career. Uh, if you're not aiming for that career, you fail. But we're not told it's also okay, exactly what you're saying there, to stay at home and nature and, uh, you know, nurture, educate our children, prepare them for life. I, I've got to say, actually, that was my, my aim. When I, you know, growing up, that was my aim. My mum did it, that was my aim. And then, you know, I wrote a book and it got, like, published and, and I just wasn't, I wasn't... So I think in my head, that juggle and that guilt, it's really there. Yeah, where are we, who are our influencers, Claire, do you think? You know, when people are coming to you and they're saying, I, I don't know whether I should work, I don't know if I should stay at home, you know, where are people getting that, that pressure from, do you think? Um, I think it's... Um internal pressure, pressure that we put ourselves under. I think it's pressure from our parents, our grandparents. Grandparents are hugely influential. We know that, and I think we are living in different times now. I think we get pressure from, from teachers when we're at school, like you say, to you know aspire to be the best that you can be. But actually, if the best that you can be and the best that you want to be is to be a stay-at-home mom, then we should really be, you know, encouraging people to feel confident in, in that decision-making. I think that it's a really important part of, you know, a lot of what I've heard about mum guilt, about all of those different things. There's a real role here for antenatal education. So when we're preparing for birth, that we don't focus so much on the mechanics of birth and what that means, because I think 
traditionally, antenatal education it focuses on that. Yeah. And actually, what we should be doing is we should have whole sessions on mum guilt. We should have whole <laughs> sessions, you know, things like that, that actually the real issues that people need to be talking about and need to be preparing for. Yeah. I just think that uh, that's, that's skewed a little bit, really, for me. And I yeah. think it's really important that we prepare people better for all of these issues that we're talking about. And before the baby is born, it is, is a great opportunity to have those conversations. Yeah. No, it really is, isn't it? I mean, Stacey, what do you do about mum guilt? Because, you know, I mean, you were in Australia last week, for goodness <laughs> sake, you know, and people must say to you, did you just spend any time with your boys? That must be really hard, actually, when people suggest that you're not doing the right thing for you and for them. Mum guilt has become my best friend. It is with me everywhere I go. I can't get rid of it. It doesn't matter what I do. I feel like it, I, I will never be able to shake that. I was in Australia, but I actually went for four days because I was so worried about going without my kids and then feeling like I'd left them behind. So I don't even know how I'm awake right now. <laughs> but a totally um, different time scale. <laughs> honestly, it's ridiculous. Even sitting next to this gorgeous little boy here, I feel like, oh, I'm not with my babies. I'm a terrible person. It is something that haunts you, whether you're a full-time working mum, whether you're a stay-at-home mum, because I, I just assume because I'm a working mum, that's why I feel guilty. But a lot of my friends who are stay-at-home parents have the, the same guilt, but for different reasons. They'll say to me, well, I'm not showing them the example of going out to work. What if I'm doing this wrong? What if I, you know, we just beat ourselves up constantly and I don't think you can ever get rid of it so I've just embraced it and guilt is now one of my best friends I talk to it a lot you know I mean Roxanne you um, run a company and you look after other mums you must feel guilty sometimes I think I feel guilty more that I'm helping others than I'm away from my children um, especially my youngest one 16 months now um, and the time I've spent working Probably over the last 12 months more than anything. Um, I feel like I've missed out, but then, as some of the others have said, I do it for my children as well. I'm lucky enough that my husband's self-employed, so we've got the flexibility of school drop-off and school pick-up. And on the occasions where I can leave work early enough to go and pick them up, that's... Hold on though, Roxanne. Your job is a pretty special job, isn't it? You, you um, run a company called J'adore Mama and you are looking after other women in, in situations which they didn't know that they would be in. So you're not just feeling guilty about the fact that you go to work. Your work is actually giving back to the community and helping other people. That's phenomenal. Yeah, I love doing that. Um, I suffered with postnatal depression when I had my last baby, as I said, 16 months ago. So admitting that, which I have done, done to a lot of the mums that come through uh, my door, um, a lot who are shocked, oh, what? so you're here supporting mums and you've been going through it as well. I suppose I've had, felt like I've had to put on a bit of a, a front and a smile on my face when I've been suffering as well um, to help other mums who are in the same situation as I am as well. Um, whether that makes me stronger, the fact that I've maybe not admitted it to, there's, there's, I mean, there's some mums that I've admitted it to who, have, like I said, have said to me, wow, I would never have, never have even thought that you'd, you know, gone through something like that. But I suppose when you do speak to those people, they can comfort you and they're there for yeah. you the same way in which you are for them. Definitely, and it helps to speak about it as well because it sort of gives me a bit of reassurance at work. Um, that when, when Rachel um, comes to the centre on a Friday, uh, we do a mum's parents support group on a Friday, and I sit in it just, just for the support for me. It's the end of the week, yeah. <laughs> end of a stressful week. I might as well go and get the support as well. We all need a bit of support sometimes, don't we? Thank you so much, Roxanne. Katie, where are you? Oh, yay, I found you. Right, here I come. Watch out, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Katie, talk to me. Hello. Um, I work for Amy and High for the Disabled Community. I'm a social worker there. Um, I've been working there for nearly three years now, and we support a lot of mums and dads uh, with mental health issues. Not only... Um, I mean, I'm a mum, I had um, my son when I was 20, um, and my son, he doesn't have any issues, you know, he's uh, neurotypically normal, um, but a lot of the families that come into our establishment, they've got children with really complex needs, um, and you can see the relief that when they walk through the door, that 
I can I can talk, I can say whatever I want, I can say I've got mental health issues, I'm really struggling, that they won't be judged. Because I've been in the position where I've been labelled as a single mum on benefits, I've been told, you know, you can't have a career and you can't be, you can't be a mum as well. You've got to choose. Um, and I've had that told to me by people close to me as well, so... You, you work with um, families with disabled children. I mean, I feel tremendous amounts of guilt just anyway for sometimes thinking, you know, oh, God, they're getting on my nerves, I need some space, I need time away from my children, and I do feel like that sometimes. As somebody who works with, with um, parents of disabled children, they must feel that guilt even more heavily because maybe they don't... A, a couple of my friends who are in that situation feel that, you know, they don't want to ever say that they need to get away from their child, but actually their, their children can be very demanding and a real, real difficult thing to deal with. Uh, do you experience that a lot? Yes, without a doubt, more often than not. Um, and the parents come to us and they say, you know... I and a lot of the time, the mums don't realise the child has a disability until she's actually given birth. So they've planned for this child and then they've got... It's hard enough having a newborn as it is, but to find out that child's got complex needs. And families come to us and they say, we need respite, it's so hard. And we help them, but it's service... They're limited by services, they're limited by funding, threshold criteria. It's so high that these families are not getting the respite that they need. Um, and we're there to try and help them do that. Well, thank goodness for you, Katie. Thank you so much. Anna, back to you. I'm inspired by your athletic... We are in the circus, by the way, here, we should say, up above us. I don't know if any of you have noticed, Mums, we've got a, a bike on a high wire up here that I'm not going to try and go anywhere near. But <laughs> I know. But I am going to leap over the circus ring here because there's some advice that I need. I'm watching this lovely group of mums here because you've all got such beautifully behaved tiny babies. Why did mine never behave like this? Please, tell me the secret. It's a fluke. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a fluke. Hello, sweetheart. He's saying, what are you talking about? And then who have we got here? Yeah, it's Layla and Rebecca. She's not usually this well behaved. <laughs> oh, she's picked her moment. Look, she can see the lights coming in on her. I mean, how are you finding it just sitting here and, and listening to all these different stories, different bits of advice? Is it, is it something that's, that you're finding useful? Yeah, definitely useful, but to be honest, I've spent that much time trying to keep this one entertained that I've not managed to pick up on most of it, but yeah. Well, the good thing is, it's all going to be around, you can watch it back afterwards. In yeah. fact, you can save this for when he's older. Yeah. <laughs> it's still going to be on Facebook to look at, you'll be able to scroll back through social media as well. Yeah. I suppose actually that's a really good point as well, is that, that things, you know, from anything from what's on TV to what we might want to try and pay a bit of attention to, kids don't always make it easy, do they? Yeah, they're, well, they're just a distraction, aren't they? You just, I think as a mom, you need to be able to do 10 things at once, don't you? Yeah, no, that's very true. Has anybody heard something today or heard any story that they've maybe never heard anybody mention before something that you've perhaps struggled with or experienced and and for the first time today you know you've heard somebody say actually yeah no I I feel that yeah definitely the mum guilt the really? mum guilt is just something I have a lot did you think it was just you why'd you get the mum guilt um well I work I'm at uni uh, my daughter started school so the time that I could put aside for her during the day I don't have it anymore She's in after school club, she goes to breakfast club. And I just think, you see other mums picking their kids up and I just think, oh, I wish I could, but you know, we're just not fortunate to be able to live without my wage. But it's so. interesting that you see that as a bad thing, but then mm. actually, you know, sometimes, well, a lot of days, my five-year-old is picked up from school by his dad and he has said before, why can't I go to after school? Everybody else is at after school club. <laughs> You're taking me yeah. home. What's going she on She does here? love it, actually. So that's, that's a ridiculous thing. She says, oh, mummy, I love after school club. So she's happy. It's me. It's me with the problem. Yeah, she loves it. Yeah. It is, yeah, it's all about perception, isn't it? Who else has, has had that moment? Let's talk about the mum guilt for a few minutes. Who has really felt mum guilt? Tell me, tell me as, a, as a light shines on you, tell me about your mum guilt. Um, three years ago, um, my son was, would have been four then, and I had a stroke. Um, and then I had a, a series of small strokes, and I was left um, for a time I couldn't walk, and I couldn't do anything for him. And I'm really lucky that I've got a very supportive mum um, throughout my whole life and um, she was there to do things with him but it wasn't the same because I knew that if she took him to the Lego Discovery Centre it wouldn't be the same as me taking him and so I had 
all that guilt. I'm a single mum as well, and I've carried the guilt from him being born that am I enough for him? Um, and throughout the last couple of years, and I'm not going to say I suffer with anxiety and depression, I'm going to say I live with it because I've accepted that it's part of my life. Um, but every day I do still get that pang of guilt that he's seen things in the last three years where it's me collapsing on the floor or uh, me unwell or crying or whatever. And I think, how is that going to impact on him as he yeah. grows up? But I think that today um, and the way everybody's talking, I think that maybe the next generation is going to grow up more understanding. And so hopefully there won't be as much guilt around and people yeah. will be able to talk out freely about their experiences. But it's our own perceptions as well, because yeah. you talk about that, about not being with him at those moments. But I yeah. see you as a mum who made all of those things happen at such yeah. a difficult time for you. He was still at front of your thoughts. You were making sure he was yeah. doing these things, making sure he was going to these places. Yeah. And actually what will happen is that he'll look at this in years to come and he'll go, God, look at my incredible mum. <laughs> she was out there telling people about her story. And he's... Um, I always get told he's incredibly kind and caring and thoughtful, and his teacher was always telling me that. And I always think probably what he's been through has added more to his character. So I'm quite, I do feel proud of myself that I've still been able to, to do things and help him along the way. Because I kind of think everything happens for a reason, and our lives would be so different if I hadn't been ill and stuff. So it's just one of those things, isn't it? But you'll always feel guilty about yeah. stuff, so... But you know what you said there, mum, mum pride. We need to forget yeah. mum guilt, don't yeah. we? And think of the things that we do. And, and Rochelle, turn it into mum pride instead. Yeah. Well, 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 I'm trying, but, you know, as much we're encouraging everyone to talk, mum guilt seems to be a running theme, doesn't it, Emma? Yeah, definitely. I've got a really um, poorly husband, um, and I beat myself up every day, thinking that maybe... You know, I could be a better mum, but I don't think I can be a better mum. So it's quite emotional. Sorry. No, it's okay. Listen, if it's still in the right place, it's totally fine. You, you, you beat yourself up for, for what, re what reason? Um, just basically being mum and dad. Mm -hmm, so. mm -hmm. you've, you've got a lot to on, and you can, you can only, you have to take that minute for you, and it's okay to get down about it, and it's yeah. okay to feel that. And you're. If, I, I think, genuinely, if, if we didn't feel mum guilt, we essentially wouldn't be being a mum, right? Your gut, that, that's your job. That's your job to look at, and you want the best for them 24-7. So if you feel like you're not giving everything, you're going to feel mum guilt. But that's because you're spreading yourself thin, maybe, and you've, you've, you've got a lot on. Yeah, I mean, everybody says to me, oh, you're doing an amazing job. I don't know how you do sure it. You and it's like, I stand back and I think... How am I doing this? I it it's kind of like autopilot. I think you just, just you just it. do it. You just literally you focus on your work, what you've got to do after work, how many hospital appointments you've got to go to, the tests, the tests that are coming up, the results to wait for, and it's just like every day's a battle. But um, well, it, it, it's, it's going to be tough if you, you're the backbone, yeah. right? You're, you're yeah. the one making it happen. You're a strong mum. Don't yeah. be down. You're yeah. a real strong mum. You should feel the mum pride. Yeah. Absolutely. Well done. Anna. Yeah, I mean, it, it, stories like that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Because there, well, there are people here and people at home who will, who will probably, to be honest, be as upset as you were just there, hearing that and letting it out. And... You know, it's like you said, if one person somewhere, anywhere has heard that and felt it and shared it, then that's such a brilliant thing. So thank you. And thank you to, I mean, all of our mums here, to everybody who's been involved as well on the hashtag Mum Takeover. Um, it's important to say as well, you know, we're sharing experiences, we're sharing our thoughts, we're sharing advice. And if you want some links to some really good help, you should have a look at the website. We made it specially for this. There's all kinds of brilliant videos on there. You can upload your own, but also, bbc.co.uk slash mumtakeover is a link to all kinds of support networks and advice that you might need. So have a look on there. Um, I can see out of the corner of my eye that Stacey, who was complaining that she didn't have a baby to cuddle, has appropriated somebody's baby. I stole a baby. <laughs> I definitely stole a baby. I'm so broody. This is terrible for me. I'm literally walking around stealing people's babies. Help. Um, no, she's beautiful and happy. She's gorgeous. Say hi. 
<laughs> Hi, Mum. Take over. Babies love microphones. That's worth knowing. <laughs> these big, these big fuzzy things—they're the best toy they've ever seen. <laughs> I am thoroughly enjoying myself. Anyway, <laughs> this is what I came for. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Uh, let's talk to our panel again, just briefly for a moment. I mean, we've we've had a really emotional few minutes. You know, talking about the pride and the guilt and how you deal with everything really and, and it's so individual I think listening to all of these stories it's so individual for everybody isn't it Neve you know every person's story we can draw something from but then you just realize that there's that's why there's no one size fits all answer to it I guess is there absolutely I mean the thing as well is is what I was saying earlier about small daily achievements and, and setting realistic goals makes such a huge difference because it really is about being able to give yourself a pat on the back when you do something, even anything small, you know, just allow yourself to feel proud of yourself. And before you know it, you can shift that balance. But guilt is so tough to deal with. For me, it was breastfeeding not happening. That was a huge thing that made me feel so guilty, especially somebody who's so into kind of natural foods and a holistic way of life. I just couldn't get my head around it. And I thought to myself, you know what? My baby's really healthy. There is incredible formula made these days. Science has made some amazing formulas. She's healthy. She's happy. If she's beaming up at me, why am I allowing myself to focus on these silly things that really don't mean that much in the grand scheme of things? I think you have to be able to shift the focus um, and, 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 and really feel more proud of yourself. In terms of going back to work, just briefly, um, for me, I, I, you, you know, you can make all these plans before you have a child. You never know what will happen. I thought, I'll, I'll just take a few months off work. I was a complete workaholic. I thought, I can't imagine my life without work. I ended up taking a whole year off. I just loved being with my daughter so much. And I, I didn't know I'd have physical challenges like the problems I had with my back. But in that time, I really, truly got to know, you know, what kind of mother I wanted to be. And taking that pause in my life had a hugely positive impact. It made me realize that I want to make a difference within mental health, which is what I spend a lot of my time doing these days. But I actually put Genevieve in nursery for two days a week, which was a decision that I always wanted to do, but made me feel quite guilty. None of my friends had put their children um, you know, into nursery or daycare. And, and it wasn't because I was going back to work. It was actually just because I thought my daughter would benefit from it. And she loved it. And she kind of progressed so much more just from being around other babies and having these incredibly talented people taking care of her and giving her, you know, painting one minute yeah. and making bread yeah. another minute. I came to collect her, she was covered in flour, <laughs> they'd been making bread. It was brilliant. But I think you shouldn't feel guilty about these decisions you make. Just yeah. be true to yourself as a mum. You're doing well, you're doing the right thing for your child and yourself.